So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Wang. I think many of you know Aijin, but we have a lot of new faculty in the audience. One of the things that we are interested in here at UC Davis is leveraging the many assets of the institution, including the veterinary school and the engineering school, and trying to bring that to bear on issues related to surgical disorder. So uh, I would say that Dr. Wang is an example of someone who has worked hard to uh, leverage those strengths for a broad range of uh, people in the audience. I'm also going to embarrass him a little bit by um, announcing that he also just got his first R01, and we're really proud of that uh, and really pleased to have developed that as a Davis uh, project here. So <clears throat> I think many of you know Dr. Wang is a, a PhD bioengineer who did his bioengineering training at Berkeley, and we were fortunate enough to recruit him here to Davis. So Dr. Wang. Thank you, Dr. Farmer. Hopefully this works good. Can everybody hear me okay? Right. Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Ai Jun. Uh, so actually, uh, time does fly very fast. I have been uh, in uh, UC Davis for five years actually. So I'm the, one of the PhDs in our department. I'm doing the research in our uh, surgical bioengineering lab at Research2. I've been using this slide to introduce our uh, overall uh, research strategy and uh, the uh, research projects. So basically, we're interested in combining stem cells and biomaterial uh, scaffolds uh, and engineer those properties for surgical disease treatment. So in the lab, we're using a lot of uh, translational disease models for human diseases. And today I'm gonna also actually talking, talk about uh, our research for other patients, like human patients and also animal patients potentially. But I will talk about that later. So overall, we have three arms in the research side of uh, in the lab. So the first side is a medical device related biomaterial based research. So we, we engineered the biomaterial based scaffolds or devices so that the biocompatibility can be increased or function, functionality in vivo can be further enhanced. So the second arm is the more biology side. It's a stem cell biology based. We, we're developing a lot of stem cell based therapies uh, and stem cell and combination of stem cell and biomaterial scaffolds for, for regenerative medicine application. The third arm is our animal model, disease model establishment and application. So when you think about diseases, we always think about human patients and also you know, how, how to improve the current treatment. So we can potentially use a lot of animal models to understand better human diseases and also to combine these engineer components to develop better uh, treatment. So that's our overarching goal of the surgical bioengineer lab in, in our research uh, division. So there are many surgical needs, surgical problems that need to be solved uh, by using uh, a lot of regenerative medicine related approaches. For example, birth defects and, and birth, uh, fetal or and, uh, neonatal treatments, so which is a very a strength of our department because Dr. Farmer is a leader in the field and we have established a very large uh, fetal center and treatment center. So we actually have been uh, interested in fetal birth, def birth defect treatment for fetal treatment and also postnatal treatments. So there are many birth defects that could be better cared uh, by establishing novel technologies in the lab, particularly in the future. So there are also a lot of other traumatic injury and wound healing uh, needs for clinical applications as we just talked about. And so, for example, one, one of the examples like the trauma, traumatic injury, and how we can increase the healing potential and inhibiting the, the bad factor effects, so if we could. So a lot of bioengineering approaches can be combined with the surgical treatments and novel treatments can be developed that way. So the third example is a, a cardiovascular disease development or treatment, vascular grafts, like uh, transplant division or vascular division. A lot of these uh, grafts can be engineered so that the regeneration or the repair process can be even further enhanced. So today I will, again, introduce some brief introduction of uh, the research project in the lab so that 
So everyone in the room, if you're interested in using the resources and the technologies that we have in the lab for your own research of interest, that would be the, the goal of my, my presentation here. So that at least I want to introduce what we have in the lab. If you can think about your research interest and if we could, if you had, you're interested, I'm always very happy to talk to any of you about any co collaboration and how to combine the engineering components or other things so that we can uh, provide better care for the patient in the future. So the first arm is stem cell engineering. So we, ha we have lots of stem cell, stem cell resources in the lab, different type of cells, like perinatal tissue derived, primary tissue derived cell cells, or induced patient, induced patient uh, derived uh, pluripotent stem cells, or the differentiated cells from iPS cells. So for perinatal tissue derived cells, we actually we have established a pretty strong research program about placenta, placenta derived stem cells. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a. Uh, later studies. And another thing that potentially we can use these cells for uh, uh, are uh, the cells from a uh, umbilical cord or uh, cord blood or amniotic fluid. So all these cells are, we have lots of cells in the bank in our lab. So if you have any specific interest or anything that you want to know more about, let me know. I'm, I'll be very happy to talk to you about how potentially we can use these cells for any of these uh, disease treatments. So we're also interested in cell products, so we're, we're very interested in basic biology questions, but we're also very interested in how to develop cell products or cell-based but off-the-shelf cell-free products too. So cell products, I mean, you, if you could develop some cell products for any, like IV injection, infusion, or cell ECM, co-culture, cell extracellular matrix combination scaffolds for such cool patch repair or things like that or stem cell secretome. So stem cells secrete a lot of things in culture condition, or you can engineer the culture condition so that they can secrete different things. So we can develop these stem cell-based secretome or condition media or exosomes, so the nanoparticles released by the cells, we're also interested in that too. So I don't have very much time to talk very specifically about any of these, but if you're interested again, let me know, or I'll be talking about that in future other uh, opportunities. So stem cell collaborations, apparently UC Davis has a very strong stem cell program. And Dr. Jan Nota and Gilhar Bauer, uh, they're leading the stem cell program I used to for regenerative medicine, and also the GMP facility. So we are, our group actually is very actively working with uh, the IRC folks on basic science, biology science, also the product development side too. So I'm also very active working some junior faculties from the institute, like Joe and Dr. Farrell, so on developing different stem cells uh, for different disease treatments. So on the other side, actually the vet school. So today I will be talking a lot more about the vet school because I think it's really underappreciated and underused. And UC Davis has the, the best vet school and we are so lucky that we actually can partner with them and doing a lot of better research. So we are actually working very closely with the vesicle colleagues, and such as Dr. Dory Borgeson and uh, uh, Dr. Sturgis and the Spirit on deriving animal stem cells. Well, why are we are interested in animal stem cells? I think it's very important. I will talk about that later. And but I think uh, overall, you know. The animal stem cells or animal disease models are actually very close to many of human disease and human products too. So I will explain a little bit more in the future slides. So the second part about bio biomaterial. So this is a very unique shift of our department because we can actually de derive all different sorts of ECMs for any, almost any applications. So for example, we can derive native extracellular matrix ECM molecules or uh, ECM products. So by decellarizing uh, tissues, and uh, Dr. Boyd is apparently is a leader of using a lot of these uh, ECM for regenerative medicine appro approaches, and also many of us in the room are very familiar with the ECM-based scaffolds. So in our lab, actually, we are deriving new ECM materials for, for innovative applications. So the second arm is uh, about the artificial ECM. So now that we know native ECM can actually work on many, many uh, conditions and uh, can be used for many disease treatments, 
can we develop better or at least a more specific uh, artificial ECM for certain disease treatments? So actually the answer is yes. We can develop artificial ECM by making nanostructure, so nano uh, ECM, native ECM-like structure by, by approaches in the lab. So and also we can functionalize these ECM by adding specific molecules to the surface. So which means if you're interested more in one type of cells for in one condition, and you could potentially add one specific ligand that's very specifically working with this cell type to inhibit or to promote the behavior. So for example, if you're interested in the field cells, in many conditions, you can actually uh, engineer the uh, ECM to be more endothelial cell specific. So this is an example how nanofiber scaffolds can be made in the lab. So we have a technology, uh, it's called electrospinning. So it's a high power electrical field based material uh, processing technology that you can use all these almost any material to make nanostructure and they actually we have shown that the nanostructure is very important for guiding cell pro uh, behavior and uh, and uh, by migration for example so more importantly we can use this technology to make different shapes of scaffold or medical devices like for example the conduits which can be used many for many applications or patch material that's composed of nanofibers with a very controlled alignment, which is very important for cell behavior. So for biomaterial engineer collaborations, actually we, we are having a lot of uh, novel material processing and surface modification technologies developed in the lab. For example, Dr. Lam from, and Dr. Li, Liu from uh, Biochemistry. They're very they're very strong team uh, in terms of uh, biochemical modification but usually not for or, or not for medical devices. But now we are collaborating how to utilize the the uh, resources that we have in the Department of Biochemistry to for regenerative medicine applications of, uh, if, for example, medical device optimization. But medical engineer program. So from the School of Engineering, so it's we actually are lucky to have a very strong uh, engineering school and bi biomedical engineer program here too. So we're leveraging these resources, and because I came from bioengineer, actually I know these people pretty well, and we work very closely, and we, we have established many uh, new projects by combining our surgical needs and the uh, the uh, unique resources that biomedical engineer program has. So we're also working very closely with many industry partners, for example, Cook Biotech, and many of you know them, and many other uh, uh, industry partners too. So the third thing about the research is the animal models. So this is the, the primary thing that I'm going to talk about today. So we, in our lab, we have established different animal models, uh, different species of animal models for our regenerative medicine research. Rodent model, for example, we use mouse and rats uh, for mice and rats for uh, disease modeling, for example, for spina bifida or congenital deformity diaphragmatic hernia, and many other, like spinal cord injury. We have a, a spectrum of uh, animal models in the lab. And we also recently got a R03 from NIH and uh, some research support for Shri from Shriners Hospital too, to establish a, a novel model of uh, uh, birth defects or fetal treatment, which is a, a guinea pig-based research. So we're doing uh, the fetal surgery, so in a new species, which has a lot of, I'm gonna talk about this uh, in the future, event when we get more data. But the idea is very innovative and it's initiated, initiated by one of our trainees in the lab. Now he's in the vet school. So it's very interesting. I'm gonna talk about that. This is innovative animal modeling. So I think potentially for your research interest, if you're interested in developing some animal disease models for human diseases. So we could potentially help you for some uh, small animal models or some other species. So we're using a lot of sheep model for our spina bifida research program, as most of you know. And today I'm going to talk about a unique model, so naturally occurring disease model. So I'm going to talk about canine models of diseases. And potentially in the future, we can use a lot of uh, uh, models in the primate center as well. So we've been working very closely with the vet school and uh, Dr. Lloyd, I'm not sure if he's here, but Dr. Lloyd has been helping us a lot in de developing a novel uh, 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 rodent models for surgical treatment of diseases too. Okay, so one example. So today I, I don't think I can, I really want to cover a lot, but I, I don't think I can do that. But I will focus on one project, 
which is one of the the most um, successful projects in the lab, is a very strong collaboration uh, from uh, the, the clinical side, our pediatric, sur uh, pediatric surgery division, the whole division, and our lab. So we have actually develop a pretty strong translational stem cell based translational program for for many different type of birth defect treatments so as we all know you know fetal surgery is not a is not something that that's only in the textbook anymore it's something that's happening on this campus right now so how can we can we do fetal surgery based tissue engineering uh, uh, treatment better so the answer is yes absolutely because all these uh, Adult patient-based tissue engineering approaches have been very well established. Now, actually, the, the, the thing we need to do is to translate the, these technologies uh, into the fetal environment, which is very different, but it's, it's feasible, it's doable. Spina bifida, as I believe all of you know about spina bifida, it's a birth defect, a neural tube defect with the exposure of the spinal cord tissue during gestation, which can cause <coughs> paralysis and many other problems with these patients with their, when they are born. So Dr. Farmer and it was the PI on the mom's trial, and she and many other pioneers are leading the field on doing fetal surgery of treatment these, uh, for treatment of these patients. So the mom's trial actually was published in 2011 <clears throat> with a very strong art, uh, like conclusion that fetal surgery is better than post tre treatment for these patients with spina bifida. So it's very promising because you know it shows that the fetal surgery is very important for from functional outcome. However, the results are sporadic for many patients, and especially for motor function uh, re recovery in after birth is not uh, that optimal. So we are hoping that we can combine uh, novel tissue engineering based stem cell based re uh, research approaches with the fetal surgery uh, technology so that we can improve, we can improve the treatment better. We've been using the, uh, the uh, SHEEP model for many, many years, and Dr. Pharma is one of the leaders of developing this model, the fetal, uh, fetal SHEEP model. It's very similar to human condition. If you think about the whole thing from many different ways, the size of the fetus of the sheep, and also many, many, uh, other things related to the treatment and also the de fetal development. So these lambs, when they're born, they develop very typical paralysis, very similar to human patients too. So very, uh, we really appreciate the grant that we so received from California Institute for Regenerative Medicine almost two years ago, actually. So Dr. Farmer and I are serving the uh, PIs and co, co PI and co on this grant. So the idea is to combine fetal surgery with stem cell products for a better treatment for spina bifida. The primary, primary focus was uh, the paralysis, that motor function associated with these uh, patients. And recently, as Dr. Farmer earlier mentioned, we, so the CERN project is more translational. We're really thinking that by collaborating very closely with uh, <coughs> excuse me, the IRC and our uh, GMP program, we're developing a stem cell product. So it's a very translational. I think we're hoping in, in a short period of time, we will be able to translate the technology that we're developing in the lab to the clinical for patients. So on, this, on the other side, we're developing a lot of basic science-based technology development. For example, the, this R1 and R3 grants that we recently received, so in July and August, just started. So we're focusing on developing new technologies and for further improving the, uh, the treatment for these patients. I will talk a little bit more detail later. So the stem cell program, just wanna highlight this program because I think if you're interested in stem cell research or clinical applications, I really encourage you to go to talk to our stem cell program uh, folks, Dr. Janota and many others are there and it, it, it's a really, really a huge resource for our uh, research. And our GMP facility on campus here so the goal of GMP, good manufacturing practice, is to manufacture good quality, quality products for patient care. So it's not just for animal research, it's more for patient care, for patient applications. So in our lab, we have been very interested in using placenta or placenta-related other tissues for deriving stem cells for many diseases, including birth defects. 
So placenta can be uh, usually discarded at birth, and they can they can be uh, available for many uh, at different gestational ages. And we all know that placenta is a very important organ for fetal development, and we have developed a protocol. So placenta has a, a, a multiple cell types potentially you can get from the organ. So many different types of cells. So we are particularly interested in mesenchymal stroma cells from placenta. So we have developed a protocol to isolate mesenchymal stem cells from placenta. And they, are, they have very unique properties for, compared with the adult, stem, adult bone marrow mesis, bone marrow mesenchymal stroma cells. Placenta mesenchymal stroma cells, we call them PMSCs, are very unique in many different ways. So they're multipotent, which means they can differentiate into many lineages if you induce them. So if you transform them into a certain environment, they may in, uh, differentiate into certain lineages. And if you induce them in vitro, so potentially they can be used for many different things. And also they're secreting a lot of uh, very important wound healing and uh, immune modulatory factors. So these are, so these factors are, so all MSCs are secreting a lot of factors actually. But placenta MSCs are secreting a set of uh, quite unique factors. For example, we have been very interested in uh, some neurotrophic factors, <clears throat> some, uh, from some growth factors like hypothesized growth factor, neurotrophic factors such as uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factors. They're very neuroprotective and they're very androgenic too. So they can, they can protect neurons, they can regenerate tissue better or provide a better environment for regeneration. So we have been looking into the, uh, the gestational age differences from these cells and compare these cells with bone marrow, adult bone marrow MSCs, we have identified many, many uh, different uh, unique properties. So today I think I will switch gear a little bit over to how, how we have been trying to use uh, different animal models for advancing our research and how the collaboration teamwork really can, can make a better, uh, better uh, research outcome. So I think most of you have seen this video, but I, will, I wanna show this video again because I'm gonna compare what we have done in the past and now what we're re uh, uh, achieving these days as well. So for those who do not know this video, well, I think in different, uh, uh, well, we have some new members in the lab, in, in the room anyway. So, <clears throat> so this video was done a couple years ago, actually. We, we, uh, this is a fetal surgery, uh, stem cell combination of uh, fetal surgery for, for the treatment of spina bifida and so there are two twins from the same mom. One was treated with stem cells, which is actually this one. The other one was treated without stem cell with everything else, all the basic matrix and everything else. So at the birth, actually, we noticed, you know, the, the lamb treated with stem cells and matrix actually was able to walk, stand and walk. It's the process associated with, to, to this spina bifida disease is almost completely gone. And the other lamb treated with matrix only without stem cells is actually still developing very typical paralysis associated with disease, disease, disease. Again, very close to this, how the lamb was able to walk at birth. This is 24 hours after birth. So the lamb was able to stand and walk almost normally when the, when the lamb is born. So this is not the first, well, this is the first time, but this is not the only time. We have been repeating this very consistently now. So we are very confident that the stem cells plus matrix actually the combination product is changing the behavior of the, these animals. So, but this, is, this was done in the fetal sheep model. So I will explain why I want to emphasize this. So this is the, the, the uh, uh, score, how the lamb was able to, lambs were able to walk at birth. So the better, the, the best is a 15 point. So a lot of these lambs actually were able to walk, but now we have more on this side too. So the lambs, the multifunction outcome is actually significantly uh, enhanced. And from histology, we also notice that this is the stem cell plus matrix group. You see a lot of neurons. So, well, this is normal spinal cord. I've explained this before, but this is the skin repair. So the, this is the fetal skin repair without any stem cell, any scaffold. So this one, this group is the fetal skin repair plus scaffold, but without stem cells. So this one is, is the fetal skin repair plus scaffold with stem cells. We're seeing a lot of more neurons, a lot more neurons in this group, and we're correlating this, the, num the density of neurons 
to how well the, the lamb was able to walk at birth. So, which indicates, you know, the better that you can preserve these neurons, the better the animal fo motor function will be preserved at birth. So, can we translate this really to, to all these patients? So the answer, we're hoping to answer this very, this question very soon. So for the fetal patients that who are eligible for fetal surgery, I think we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna see. We're gonna we have been very getting all these uh, motor function evaluation good data very consistently in the past years with the generous support from California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and we're hoping we can translate this into fetal patients fairly soon. So, but there are a couple of things we wanna so we wanna be a little bit more ahead of the the community. So we are thinking about, so what about the patients who are not eligible for fetal surgery? What about the patient who, for, for whatever reason, was not re receiving fetal surgery? What about for po postnatal treatment? Is it possible? Is it possible to translate our stem cell product to these uh, patients too? So we, we think about the animal models. So the fetal lamb model is a surgically created. It's very consistent and our group has done a lot of refining uh, factors and all these potential uh, uh, contributing factors, how to make the disease model more consistent. We're very good at this model and the, the but it's a very, it's a surgically created. So it, all these animals are quite consistent between each other, but it's, a, it's artificially made. So the second, well, there are some other chemically induced uh, spina bifida models too. So I'm, I'm not talking about that in this slide, but we are doing the rodent model with chemicals that we give into the uh, animals when the, during gestation so that the, the, the spina bifida can develop it that way. So it's a little bit different from surgically created, but still it's a pretty artificial. So, and there are a lot of actually patients that we always, we have been overlooking them. So they are, they are naturally occurring disease models in the, in the world. What are they actually, or how, why we're interested in these? So in 2011, Dr. Collins, from uh, the director of NIH, actually, with, uh, the, he published a paper in Science Translational Medicine. So he asked a question: So, is the medical practice or the patient treatment currently based on the animal study that we have been doing for many, many years? Is this correct? Is this the right thing that we're doing? So one of the things that he mentioned, I want to spend a minute here to emphasize. So the average length of time from target discovery to approval of a new drug currently averages about 13 years, 13 years for one drug. The failure rate exceeds 95%. This is actually pretty bad. And the cost per successful drug exceeds one billion. So this is actually what we're, we're having right now, or a couple, at least a couple of years ago. I think things are changing, but still, all the, so, there are many reasons that are contributing to this, but one of the main reasons that we're thinking about is the, the model. So the, so the poor translation from an induced animal model to humans in an induced model, so animals are purposely injured, so, which is really true, because you want to control, you want to understand certain things, you want to make a model that, that's very uniquely to this disease and very precisely controlled, so that you, you would uh, be able to investigate how you can correct this. So this is, uh, and there are many other things about the genetic or physiological uh, diversity in these patients is completely overlooked. So can we do this any better? Actually, after, so, well, the answer is yes, at least we're trying these days, we're trying. So one example is our, well, the way to do this better, I think, or many other, uh, many people in the field are thinking, is to combine the, the knowledge that we can develop from the vet world. So UC Davis has, a, as I mentioned earlier, has a, the strongest vet school. Potentially we can do a lot more than others. So in 2015, actually, the, the, under the One Health can, like, uh, the, uh, idea, so Dr. Borderson, Dr. Farmer is here too, and many other leaders on campus over here, they published a paper in Science Translational Medicine. So the idea is to emphasize the strength of companion animals and companion animals that had, that are developing all those uh, natural occurring diseases. And the emphasis is how to use these animal models, how to treat these animals as a patient, and also how to use this model to understand what's the better idea of treat treatment. Can we do this any better? So 
So this is from the VIRC, the Vet School Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And uh, Dr. Dory Borderson and the Associate Di Director uh, uh, Simpton. So in traditional classical research uh, pep pipeline for from preclinical models to clinical trials. So we have preclinical models, usually like a lot of mouse models or other surgery models and other disease models are very typical use. And then phase one, phase two, and phase three. So the translational side is from here to here. So, well, the the a uh, lot of the uh, um, like FDA and many other agencies are encouraging researchers to develop multi different animal models because one model, like one mouse model, may not be accurate enough to reflect the you know the outcome or the treatment condition for for the disease, which is usually very complicated. However, you know, we are, so the VRC actually and the whole under the One Health conception, we are asking, can we add another phase, phase zero clinical trial, which is using the natural occurring disease models to test, you know, the drug or the product that we're developing from the small animal model or from the lab, and before we move into uh, the traditional classical clinical trials. So in UC Davis, actually, you know, the patient care, human patient care side, and the animal care, patient, side, patient care as well side, they are interacting each other because we can learn a lot from our dogs, our cats are developing the same conditions, a lot of very similar diseases. And we're actually also improving the patient care by doing research in the lab as what we're doing right now. And also we're improving patient care to animals by developing regenerative therapies, for example, in the lab. So all these three factors actually are very closely interacting each other and potentially if we have all three, we can do a better research strategy. We can have a better research strategy. And at UC Davis, actually we do have all three factors pretty strong. So we have the medical school and the vet school and our lab, they are different uh, technology development site. So speaking of uh, you know, the companion animal associated uh, diseases. We've been looking at, so there are many other diseases that the animals are developing just like our, us, because we're living in the same environment. We're having very similar, a lot of other things. We're developing very similar conditions. So for spina bifida, actually, bulldogs, they develop very similar conditions as a human spina bifida patients. So the hind limb paralysis, and also the uh, incontinence, all these clinical really things, most of them are, well, are reflecting, uh, being reflected in this animal model, actually. From disease diagnosis, this is a patient, human patient with the MRI, by focusing, if you look at this extrusion or the exposure of the spinal cord. This is the, the nature of the disease. And also here, this is a dog patient with, the, with this opening in the back. The same level, well, similar ex extent in terms of the exposure. And the outcome is similar too. So for many, many of these patients in canines, actually, we don't see them very often because they're euthanized when they're born, very unfortunately. So, well, this is one of the dogs that we, the early, early days that we first saw from the vet school. So unfortunately, he died actually a while back. So this dog has a wheelchair because he was not able to walk at all. He was dragging, even without the wheelchair, he was dragging his, uh, the, the, the fourth quarter, the whole thing. But with this engineer device, actually the, the dog was able to move, so he, can, he was able to go some, a little bit, but very, there wasn't very much uh, that we could really do at this point. And some physical therapies were, were given to this uh, patient, but still it's pretty limited. And some other dogs actually are better, well they, they were able to walk, or they were not diagnosed at birth, so they, they were survived. But some of them are diagnosed later in just the, later after they're born they're born because at about six to eight weeks they're supposed to be able to walk but they were not and they were actually diagnosed and many of them are uh, are diagnosed with actually this uh, birth defect spina bifida so this is one dog that we we didn't cheat unfortunately but we were hoping to help all these dogs but because it's a pretty rare condition but we have seen quite a quite a few. So this is the one that we were not able to treat, so, but she was able to walk when they're born. So this is when he, she was born. This is 
seven weeks when she was born. She was uh, actually adopted by the rescue group, local rescue group here. And she you can see she was able to walk, but she was really, and if you look at like 17 weeks of age. So she was able to walk a little bit better, but actually not very much. And she was using the hooks like more than the 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 paws for for uh, for walking or it's very unstable. So when she was walking, and she was always always uh, you know turning towards this side or the other side. So it's really really unstable, and she she was uh, incontinent too. So it's very similar to human condition, but with a better better. Uh, so can we do can we translate our surgical treatment to these patients? Actually, we we tried this. We did this. So this is one of the dogs that we treated. So we developed, we, by working very closely with the best school surgeons, Dr. Farmer and Dr. Sturgis, actually they were both in the room with a team of us there. So we are all, because this is the first time ever people have treated uh, spina bifida patients in canines after birth. So this dog was, the MRI that I treat, showed you earlier was this dog actually. So she has a very, ex, very obvious, ex, Posure of the spinal cord right here, and by doing the stem cell product and surgical treatment, very similarly to the uh, sheep model, actually we treated this patient. And this is MRI, so this is before before treatment. You can see the exposure of the spinal cord, and there's a cross section. You see the exposure right here. There's no coverage there, and this is after the treatment, after the surgical treatment, we put the stem cells here and the patch material right here, and the whole thing is covered actually pretty well. This is eight weeks after surgery. This is the, the only time point that we did MRI with after the surgery. So what happened to this dog? So we're using the same uh, similar stem cell based product plus a surgery, surgical treatment. So nine weeks old, pre-op, see she's, well this is the, the boy. So he was able to walk, but you can see he was using a lot of the, his hocks and he was mo moving like this way sideways a lot. But he's cute, absolutely. <laughs> so, t 11 weeks old, so two weeks post-op, you can see what, if there's any, please, what is going on? Okay, it's morning. So two weeks after surgery, actually, I think, well, both of them, which treated these two, they are from the same litter, brother and sister, but they have the same problem. Out of 11 puppies, actually, these two develop problems. So at two weeks, actually, you kind of, I think, I kind of see she, she, they were able to, to walk pretty good. So this is 17 weeks old, eight weeks after surgery. Actually, I think, you know, at least we, we've been really focused on the motor function now, but actually the incontinence was one of the things that we're, really interesting the early, well, the whole thing still, but at least we're seeing that these patients are doing overall pretty good. So this is actually very recent. So now they are both adopted to New Mexico in a new home, and they are seven, almost eight months old actually. Actually, you can see they're, they're both this one and this one. They're both able to walk and run and jump pretty normally. We're very, very happy for them. And the, the family is also very happy. So we have been talking with them for, they're very dedicated and we really appreciate their, their, their contribution to the research actually. And they are so happy for, for their little ones. You know, they are able to walk pretty well. Okay, I think, you know, this is the, you know, how we're trying to translate our stem cell based treatment to patients to animal patients and also in the future to, to human patients. So at this stage, I'd like to say, and this is natural occurring disease model has overall pretty underused actually. But here at UC Davis, if you're interested in certain disease, you potentially can, can really, uh, you know, we can help you to establish some translational work for these patients too. So I wanna also emphasize, you know, the we, we, we are actually developing the stem cell based treatment for um, preparing the pre ind materials to the FDA. I think, you know, from the FDA point of view, it could be a very strong 
point too for the product development because we're using a large animal model or if you if you want to say so their patients really they're, we're helping these patients they're adopted you know they're cared just like human patients we're developing these stem cell product for these patients uh, rather than well we're doing these animal models research too but the fda should be be well they're seeing this from a safety point of view at least you see this these products are tested in patients so, so far over over half a year so they're doing pretty good. And from a out, outcome functional recovery point of view, they are actually, we're seeing a pretty complete you know, uh, evaluation for these patients, not just one thing. Okay, I wanna conclude our, my presentation today by saying that surgical bioengineering, so we're, that's, this is what we do. Surgical bioengineering uh, approaches can, can be used for many disease treatment, can provide better treatment potentially, and so, I want to say something about the natural occurring disease model in our companion, our good friends. And potentially we can develop better treatments based on the, these, uh, the treatments for these patients first. And but at the same time, we're saving a lot of these patients and caring these patients who usually are not cared at all. So we're happy about that too. So I think I want to emphasize that med school, vet school, engineer school that we all have on campus over here so the nice collaboration between all these are actually very important. And this is what we have been doing the past years. So I've been at UC Davis for five years. So in the past like five years, we have been very luckily funded by many agencies. But all, almost all of these are, are a combination, well, these projects are a combination of different expertises, from the lab side to the clinical side, from the basic science to the engineering side, from the vet school to the med school. You know, the, the, I would really want to emphasize the, the, uh, the combination of expertise, you know, the collaboration between departments and between schools. So potentially we can really do uh, a lot of things much better. So I want to thank to all these agencies who are really supporting our research. Very, very helpful for maintaining the lab and uh, having us to investigate what possible, what, what can be done better. So I also wanna just give you a, a few slides if you're interested, especially our residents and medical school students, if you're interested in our research, a couple of papers that we recently published. I think we have lots of ideas buried in these publications, how we're developing translational research, and how we're actually develop, uh, discovering uh, novel uh, lichens or ma materials or uh, chemicals potentially can be used for many different different diseases. And we're also interested in developing translational aspect of these products, how we can make these stem cells based stem products in, in the GMP environment and for human care potentially, and how we can deliver these cells and we'll test different things. And actually we're, in this paper already, if you're interested in how we can actually uh, treat these dogs. This is our recent paper published uh, about the canine placentamases. We have done a lot of human placentamases. In this paper, paper actually, this is the, one of the first papers that describes how similar the placentamases from canines and humans. So they look pretty similar. So potentially, you know, we can investigate the behavior of these cells in by using the canine cells, and we may be able to inform the human stem cell research better. Okay, and thank you very much for the team and thank you for your attention. Well, Aijin, that was a great overview and I'm a little embarrassed how much of our work you showed, but, um, <laughs> but we are pretty proud about it and we are pretty excited about the dogs. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, it was just really fun to go operate um, at the vet school. I know um, several other the faculty are involved in this. The Cancer Center has a great program that also involves a lot of dogs, I think everybody remembers feline leukemia, if you ever had a cat pet, but that was something you always worried, worried about. So there's a lot of translational work related to this. Uh, Bob Cantor's involved with this as well, and uh, lots of other things. I think Aijin, you know, didn't talk about some of the work that's being done with our transplant colleagues, with our vascular surgical colleagues. Right. Um, has a technique to endothelialize uh, in a way that's uh, potentially better. This is work actually being done in Kit Lamb's lab. Right. Uh, I know Dr. Galabi is gonna be working with Kit Lamb as well on for cancer applications to use his nanoparticles to line the inside of blood vessels to conceivably 
Um, you prove our ability to coax blood vessels and prevent them from getting potentially even atherosclerosis and some of these other diseases. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that is happening. Um, and I really appreciated uh, your emphasis on getting other people to think about, you know, what's a problem you want to solve? And, and we could, uh, could put some creative energy around it. And uh, even although we as clinicians don't necessarily have the time to do all this work, by partnering with people like Aijin and other colleagues on campus, they can help sort of execute some of the thoughts we may have. And you never know how crazy an idea might be something, turn into something really great. So thank you, Aijin. Thank you, Dr. Farmer. We probably have a minute or two if folks have some questions. All right. If not, that was spectacular. Um, Thank you. In, in, the, in the trauma world, one of the most interesting advances is regeneration of uh, transected uh, peripheral nerves, particularly the motor ones, whether it's in the spinal cord, somebody doing it, or whether it's a peripheral nerve. Right. And there's this concept floating around that's been presented a number of times of wrapping a nerve in a tube and using the tube to realign the nerve fibers for health of regeneration. Can you comment on that? And what's, it, what's going on in the data with that? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I, as Dr. Farmer mentioned, so I, I think I didn't have time to talk specific about that or any of the vascular work. We've been working together with our transplant surgeon uh, colleagues and uh, vascular surgeon colleagues. So, so for peripheral nerve regeneration specifically, I personally have been working with that disease for, for quite a while when I was a post at Berkeley and before that during my grad school. So far, I think they, well, they, the concept of using alignment of the scaffold or medical devices I think it's absolutely true. And the, the, actually the neurons and exons, the exons from the neurons and Schwann cells, all these cells or the parts of the cells, they are very sensitive to, to the uh, graphical features of the environment. So as you can imagine, all the exons in native tissue, they are very well aligned. I think that's all because of the, the matrix around it. They are all very organized. So by doing, you know, using the matrix, and by making the matrix in a very, uh, very organized way, actually we have shown that the axons can be guided very nicely, can reach to the target, reach the target sooner, can grow faster and longer, so axons. So I think so far, I don't believe any of these products are in clinical trial or anything yet, but I think many of them are in development. And the cells can be translated with the combination of these products too. Thanks. The, the, the videos on the dog, the translational study, the stem cells, was incredible. Seeing the Thank you. Walk. I noticed some of the dogs, uh, the two dogs were wearing diapers. Um, was that related to urinary incontinence or fecal incontinence of both? And then do you want to comment on um, perhaps why that is and some of the strategies to deal with that? Right. Well, I think Dr. Farmer may be, may be uh, able to help on this as well. But I think for human patients and these dog patients, they both develop very uh, similar problems. So incontinence is associated with this disease in humans and in these dogs. When actually these two dogs that we treated, from ever from the, they were born, they were incontinent. And so far, we actually in the very beginning, we were trying to help these dogs in many, every way, including incontinent control. So, yeah, so but, the kids are incontinent with spina bifida, and that what is often leads to death is that they, if you don't adequately drain the bladder and they don't have good management, then they go into renal failure. There are a lot of the uh, kidney transplant patients are former spina bifida kids that have done well otherwise. And, but if they're poorly managed or they don't get good care, then that's the cause of death. That's probably why that bulldog that was untreated died is because nobody was doing you know, intermittent catheterization on a bulldog, right? So um, we, I, we're starting to understand that. It's, I think it's more complex than just the spinal cord problem because I think there's a, some additional maldevelopment of the musculature of the sphincters and the um, urinary sphincters, and people are looking at that and collaborating with one of the pediatric urologists to look at that here. Right. So I think, although I had hoped that maybe we could cure this disease before I retired, I suspect <laughs> it's, it's going to take longer than that because it's more complicated than a one-stop fix. But each What's amazing is we can make progress. 50 years ago, nobody did any research. If you try to research spina bifida 
in, in the 1950s and the 1960s, there are zero papers because everyone assumed that there was nothing that you could do for these children, that they were paralyzed at six weeks gestational age. And nobody bothered. All the research was going into sort of reading out afterwards or things you could do. Nobody even imagined that it was doable. And that's, that's true of many things. Um, and I, 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 this story is just so much fun because it really, I think it gives hope that the science matters. And science matters is what we really think of as surgical diseases. And only in academic medical centers are we going to make a difference. And that's why we're all here. And we can't do it ourselves because we don't have that nanofiber technology background really that. But you get a multidisciplinary group of people thinking about a problem, and it's amazing what comes out of it. So Aijin is truly interested in collaborating with uh, many others. And you know, another great leader in this in our department is Dr. Boyd. Hey, Right. Yes, absolutely, sir. We're developing stem cell based products, including exosomes by isolation of them, isolating them and characterizing how we can use these as a cell free product for many different things. As you said, it's very exciting. So I hope I would have uh, some opportunity in the future to, when we get more data, I would like to present to everybody about how we can actually potentially expand the use of stem cells. Thank you. All right, back to work. More problems to solve, more ideas to Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Palmer.